Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is James Fallows. I'm a staff writer at The Atlantic, and I'm excited and delighted to be moderating this program. I'm pleased to be joined today by Ty McCormick to discuss his new book, Beyond the Sand and Sea, One Family's Quest for a Country to Call Home. McCormick is a senior editor at Foreign Affairs magazine and has focused his work primarily in Africa and the Middle East. Beyond the Sand and Sea follows the story of Assad Hussein and his family over a three-year period to understand refugee life and place in America. Assad was born in Kenya's Dadaab refugee camp, home to more than 200,000 Somali refugees. He connected to America through donated novels and stories of his sister's life as an immigrant in the United States. Through impossibly good luck, which we'll hear about, and uncommon generosity, Assad would eventually reunite his family in the United States and win a scholarship to Princeton University. Today, Ty McCormick is here to share more about Assad's family, African immigration, and the life of refugees. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour. I want to ask, want to be able to relay questions from you as well. If you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube, and we'll get to them later in the program. Ty McCormick, thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is such a wonderful conversation to get to have with you, Jim. Um, I so enjoyed your last book, uh, Our Towns, and I'm really looking forward to uh, the HBO documentary, which is uh, here <laughs> coming out just around the corner. Well, thank you. Thank you. You're nice to mention that. And I will say sincerely, as opposed to just in a log rolling mode, that, as you know, I really enjoyed your book. I think it's it both is captivating as a read and also very significant for this time in world history and American history in uh, politics and personal life and all the rest. So I know there is a scene in what you think is appropriate for sort of both setting off the, the book itself, but also setting the stage for our discussion. So please, I turn the stage over to you to read a little scene from your book. Thank you. Yeah, I'll read a little passage from the introduction um, where Assad is waiting in line at customs uh, in his first journey to the United States. As he stood in line for immigration at John F. Kennedy International Airport, Assad Hussein tried to recall the final stanza of a poem by William Ernest Henley. In front of him, over the heads of a dozen disheveled travelers, stood a row of glass cubicles marking the border of the United States. Unremarkable as it must have seemed to the other travelers that day, the sterile fluorescent lit gateway to America felt surreal to him. Years before in a desert refugee camp in East Africa, he had scrawled the poem on a slab of sheet metal he used to keep the sand from blowing into his tent. Henley's words had famously sustained Nelson Mandela during his long imprisonment on Robben Island, and Assad had sought in them a similar source of inspiration. He hoped they would one day strengthen his resolve to reach the United States. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. How many times had he read those lines growing up a citizen of nowhere in the world's largest refugee camp, a sea of sand and thorn scrub and makeshift tarpaulin dwellings in the dry badlands of Northeast Kenya. The camp had been home to more than 500,000 people at one point, a city the size of Kansas City or Atlanta, except without electricity or running water. There were no paved roads, no two-story buildings, no permanent structures of any kind. Most of the refugees had fled the war in neighboring Somalia, but a growing number, like Assad, had been born in the camp and never seen their home country. Members of this new generation had spent their entire lives in limbo. Everything from the food rations that kept them alive to the arcane resettlement process that offered the only hope of a better future hinged on the whimsy of distant powers. In the Dab refugee camp, 
No one is master of his fate. Yet somehow, after 22 years of waiting, Assad had made it here. In his back pocket was a UN-issued travel document that contained a student visa. Tucked inside the document's light blue jacket was a form stating the impossible. He had been admitted to Princeton University and awarded a scholarship worth $70,000 a year. It was more than his entire family, perhaps his entire block in Dadaab, had ever seen in their lives and so improbable that he hadn't allowed himself to fully process what it meant. He didn't dare. Too many times he'd been on the cusp of breaking free from Dadaab only to have it re-ensnare him at the last moment. There was the promise from the UN Refugee Agency of Resettlement in the United States that had gone unfulfilled for 13 years. The prestigious Canadian scholarship he had devoted his entire childhood to winning only to fall short of the grade and the desperate attempt to smuggle himself out of the camp that had ended with him behind bars. Then came an executive order from President Donald Trump that shook Dadaab like an exploding mortar shell. Just days before his parents were scheduled for an interview at the US Embassy in the Kenyan capital of Nairobi, the final step in an arduous vetting process for green cards, the United States had suspended all refugee admissions and banned travelers from seven Muslim majority countries, including Somalia. Now, as the customs line inched forward, he felt sure someone would snatch this opportunity from him as well. The Trump travel ban wasn't supposed to apply to him since he'd been born in Kenya and granted a student visa, but he knew the agents at the border had the final say on who entered the United States, and there were plenty of reasons they might turn away a 22-year-old ethnic Somali man. Already, a mysterious American official had intercepted him on his layover in the Frankfurt airport. She had peppered him with questions, some of them surprisingly blunt. Have you ever been a member of an extremist organization? Do you know anyone who's been a member of an extremist organization? With each shuffle forward, Assad's anxiety grew. By the time he reached the front of the line and a young Latino agent with a crew cut beckoned with a pair of raised fingers, he could feel himself freezing up, the hint of a childhood stammer creeping back into his voice. Just answer the questions the way you practiced, he told himself. Look the agent in the eye, smile. The first few questions were pro forma. What did he plan to study? Was this his first trip to the United States? The agent swiveled in his chair to face his computer screen his sullen expression giving no hint as to what he was reading. But as the minutes dragged on, Assad was overcome with a feeling of dread. Then, without warning, a light above him began to blink red. Would you come this way, please, the agent said, stepping out from behind his desk and gesturing to a dimly lit hallway at the end of a row of cubicles. We would just like to ask you a few more questions. That introduction very usefully and artfully touches many, many of the bases in the book. And, you know, the readers will see all the different um, uh, stations that, that the, the narrative takes us from uh, the villages to the refugee camp to Princeton University to universities in, in East Africa and the drama of, of, of immigration. Let me start back down this trail again by asking you a little more about the Dadaab camp itself. I ask this because you, know, we're, you were based in, in East Africa. You've done a lot of reporting uh, on scene about refugees and their lives, not just this family, but, but many others. Your readers in the United States, they see you know, newspaper mentions or TV mentions of refugee camps all the time. What is the reality they should bear in mind when they hear about a place like uh, the Dadaab camp with a couple hundred thousand Somali refugees? Dadaab is really this fascinating, complex, really otherworldly place. It's, it's very difficult to describe, I think, to an American audience. In the book, I compare it to the fictional town of Macondo, uh, which uh, famously Garcia Marquez describes as uh, cut off from the rest of civilization by uh, forbidding swamps and mountain ranges. Uh, and of course, Macondo is, is only really visited by a small number of characters in the book. It's this band of traveling gypsies that comes to sell their wares. Uh, Dadaab is also cut off from the rest of civilization by this vast semi-desert. Uh, and it's really only visited by a few outsiders as well, mainly aid workers um, and foreign journalists like myself. Uh, and, and when you come to visit Dadaab, every time I've come to visit Dadaab, you come by air. Uh, there, there are road links, but they are unpaved and they're not terribly secure. So typically, the only way in and out is, is UN flights. And from the sky, um, 
you know, you're flying along and it's just vast nothingness between Nairobi and an hour later landing in this desert strip. You know, you look down and it's just semi-desert, a few shrubs, not a sign of human habitation for miles. And suddenly you cross this line and row after row after row of tiny houses unfurl to the horizon. And you land and you look at these houses up close and they are made from sort of anything the refugees could get their hands on. It's Mm -hmm. makeshift, uh, you know, tarps, and maybe some of them have made bricks out of the earth, uh, sheet metal if if you're lucky. And then you realize that this camp has looked virtually the same for 30 years. It came into existence in 1992, a year after Somalia collapsed into civil war. And of course, like refugee camps around the world, it was set up as a temporary safe haven except for that it's never been safe for people to go home to Somalia since then. And so an entire second and third generation of refugees are now growing up in this same camp under the same confines. And that's really where this story takes place, is a multi-generational story within, largely within the confines of this one camp. So you do talk about all different branches you know, or many branches of, of, of the family and their backgrounds before the camp and where they've gone um, since then. Can one of the main narrative arcs in your story is the different fate of Assad and his sister, uh, Marianne, of their different experiences in getting out of the refugee camp, getting towards the United States. What's the sort of overview of why their situations and fates were so different? Yeah, so the book is really the the epic story of this family's 30-year odyssey to reach the United States. And Assad and Marion are the two kind of protagonists whose stories form the bulk of the narrative. And their stories are closely intertwined, but in a way, they're, they're very different. Uh, Marion's story begins, as you say, in Somalia before the war. So she has a sense of normal life. She's, uh, of of her siblings, the only one who has a sense of what life was like before the war, before being displaced. Uh, And so they, you know, like thousands of their compatriots come to Kenya at the start of the war. Assad is born uh, 12 years after Marion, um, and of course only has this camp as his whole universe and hears about the outside world, hears about Somalia from Marion, from his parents. And then Marion was also resettled to the U.S. before the rest of the family. For a series of complicated and tragic reasons, the rest of the family is left behind. Marion goes to Arizona, begins a new life, sort of the dream that many of the refugees in the camp have. And she sends back word to Assad about what awaits in America, what kind of opportunities are there. You know, she says, in America, you can be anyone you want to be. Uh, And this is a narrative that sort of reinforces the way that a lot of people think about America in the camp. Assad, the protagonist, writes himself uh, later on that people spoke about America the way they speak about the hereafter in the camp. Um, And so, you know, he absorbed a lot of that as a child. And he, through a series of books that he got his hands on at a, at a, uh, a library that was set up by aid workers sort of discovered a great deal about American uh, culture. He writes in the same essay where he wrote about uh, people speaking about it in, as they do the hereafter. He says, you know, I've been living the American dream my whole life. I don't know how much longer I can bear to live it outside of America. Um, so the story really follows this, this sister and this brother uh, and their decades long separation um, and the ways in which they worked to try to reunite the family. A Marion from America trying to follow up on her family's case, trying to understand why decades were uh, going forward and the family was still stranded in the camp. Uh, and Assad dreaming about a better future, reading Nabokov, reading Chimamanda, reading uh, Juno Diaz, and dreaming about becoming a novelist and coming to America. Let me just ask one more question about these differential fates within the family. Back a generation ago, I saw a lot of camps like these in Asia. It was mainly, you know, refugees of the Indochina War. And we were in camps in Thailand and Malaysia and the Philippines. And some of the people were being resettled to the U.S. Some were not. Some were in this multi-generational limbo, as you were saying. And I was curious about how people made sense of the differential fate that was befalling them? Was it just accident of timing, different policies in the US, just some official who happened to favor them or not? What were the ways the different members of the family made sense of these hugely different um, fates that had befallen them? 
Well, I know that for Assad, um, I think it all felt a little absurd, which was why he was drawn to absurdist literature. I think to him, mm -hmm. Camus made more sense uh, than even, you know, uh, a, a romance novel or a crime thriller that was set in a place he couldn't understand, but adhered to at least sort of an, an overarching pattern of logic. Life in the camp didn't have any logic. Um, and it also had no way, your, your fate was entirely in the hands of these distant, faceless bureaucrats, but there was no way to check in on your case or to learn anything about its status. And Marion experienced that from the US, Assad experienced it from the camp. Uh, he also has another brother who's a kind of minor tragic character in the book who he becomes addicted to a stimulant leaf known as Mira. And he told me this really tragic story about it was his job in the family to go to the bulletin board where the camps, uh, where, where the refugees would go to see if there was any status change for their resettlement cases. And it's not like someone comes to your camp, uh, to your tent and says, you know, you're scheduled for a flight tomorrow or you have a medical exam. You have to go to the UNHCR outpost and look at that bulletin board day after day year after year, in some cases, decade after decade. And for Ibrahim, the older brother of Assad, uh, it was devastating and I think it, it had a really negative effect on him. Um, I think people cope with it in different way, ways. Uh, for those who, who are lucky enough to make it to America, I think there's a sense that they often don't look back when they get, when they get here. Assad is really, I think, unique in the sense that he still has this real connection to the place he came from and this desire to go back and to make it different. One more question on these differential fates between Assad and Ibrahim, these two brothers, one of them becoming, as you say, this um, self-taught literary um, master who, in, who has ended up at Princeton, as we'll discuss, the other who is, is um, pushed into addiction and, 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 and tragedy. Um, one would think from the outside that the latter fate of being discouraged and broken by this hopelessness would be more common among people in, in the camp. So how would you assess sort of the general despair quotient among people there? It's, it's hard to say, and I think it's very much a function of the US administration of the time. Um, hope was alive and well in the camp when I first visited it in 2016, I think was the first time that I went to the camp even though the conditions were very difficult, even though people's lives, oftentimes they had spent decades there, there was still a hope that they would, that people would be resettled and there, there was a better hope on the horizon. That changed uh, during the Trump administration because resettlement largely stopped from Dadaab. Uh, there's an argument to, to be made that Dadaab was on a per capita basis, the most affected place on the planet by the Trump travel ban. There were mm. 14,000 people at some stage of the resettlement process in 2017 on the eve of Trump's travel ban. In 2018, just eight people were resettled from the camp to the United States and just 14 were in 2019. So overnight, the entire humanitarian apparatus that was geared toward giving people a better life and some hope for the future ground to a halt. And so you saw immediately afterwards, there was a spate of suicides in some of these Kenyan camps. I wrote about one young man who was mm -hmm. in a lot of ways similar to Assad. He was this incredibly driven young man who hoped to win a scholarship, who was kind of by all accounts, this gregarious, friendly guy. His classmates call him, called him Gaddafi because he had been their elected student leader long enough to be a Middle Eastern despot. <laughs> um, and he kind of ran out of options and eventually ended up tragically taking his own life, even though in another universe you could have seen him ending up in a, in a similar situation uh, to Assad. And I think Marion in another ways, in some ways Marion I think is the most representative of, of all of the characters. Uh, you know, she has all of the potential, all of the drive, all of the sort of curiosity and sort of zest for life that Assad has but because of luck, because of barriers that are in place for women and not for men, because of lots of accidents of fate and culture, they conspired to keep her in a much uh, you know, less um, hopeful place. I think she's, you know, she's happily in the United States. Her family is here. She has five um, wonderful children. Um, but one, one detail that I think got missed in the beginning is that they actually have some siblings that are still stranded in Kenya um, and the family is not yet yeah, united, reunited, and they're still working to bring these last two younger siblings 
uh, to rejoin Assad and Marion here. So that, a lot of that has fallen on Marion's shoulders to try to yeah. bring them here. Um, but in terms of your question about representativeness and telling a, a refugee story that tells a larger story than the one uh, that just the immediate family, um, I think that Marion is, is probably the closest to, to a representative yeah. figure. But I think the family is representative of this endless statelessness. Their journey was, is, is still ongoing after 30 years since they fled their homes. Um, and this is, um, in some ways, this is the reason that I wrote the book. Uh, yeah. There was a statistic that just blew me away when I stumbled upon it. I was reading about what the UN calls protracted refugee crises. Um, and there's a very technical, boring definition, but in short, it's basically a crisis that drags on for more than six years and doesn't have an immediate prospect of being mm. um, resolved. The average length for a protracted refugee crisis in the mid 90s was, I think, something like eight years. And now it's 26 years. Oh. So essentially, these conflicts have been frozen in time. There's been no resolution. There's been no opportunity for people to go home. And so there's a whole new class of refugee who what I call in the book permanent exiles, people who face a lifetime in limbo and waiting. And so that, that's very much the story of the family in this book is, is multiple generations waiting and waiting and waiting for a better future that never seems to come. Yes, and we will get at, at near the end of our conversation to some of the larger issues of policy in, in, in the US and around the world. I just wanted to mention a way in which I had observed the other side of the policy change you were discussing and the, and the dramatic drop in the number of refugees being processed from the Dobbs to the United States. Uh, through the same time which you're, you're talking about that change in policy, my wife Deb and I were, were reporting in many areas that had been absorbing refugees largely from, from Somalia. I'm thinking of places like Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where a lot of the meatpacking industry there has a very important Somali component, also Dodge City, Kansas and Erie, Pennsylvania, where 10% of their entire population is refugees, you know, not immigrants, but wow. refugees. And the dramatic change in these communities, I mean, the, the, the change was the other end of the process you're talking about, people were not being able to get out of the camps and they were not coming to these communities too. And, and the, I think there was an awareness both among the arrivals who had come from Somalia and elsewhere and also among the uh, the organizations that were trying to um, to absorb them of just you know, the, the, the profundity of, of, of this change. Let me ask you about, uh, you, you said that you wanted to get right on the, uh, write this book, get on the story because you were noticing this phenomenon of permanent refugees, permanent ex exiles. Um, tell us about how you got connected with the family itself, how you came into the camp. What was your, because you end up being actually a significant figure or character in the book yourself. And so tell us how you first made the connection and how it evolved. So it, it was the Trump travel ban that uh, brought Assad and I together. At the time that I began working on the book, I was the Africa editor of Foreign Policy magazine. Um, and I sort of split my time between reporting and, and commissioning pieces from other uh, journalists. And so any significant piece of news like this involved me finding a way to cover it. And a few months before, I had read this beautiful short piece in the New York Times magazine by a young man that had grown up in the camp. Um, and I'd been to the camp to cover an unrelated story, you know, a year or so before. So I was sort of following news from the camp and I filed it away uh, as, you know, maybe there'd be an opportunity for me to reach out to this young man and, and offer him an opportunity to write for foreign policy. And so this struck me as the opportunity to do just that. And I sent him a Twitter message, uh, you know, a day or two after the Trump travel ban came down. And I uh, never in a million years did I think he was still in the camp. You know, I thought, Anybody who was writing in the New York Times would have been one of the lucky few to get out. I thought certainly he'd been resettled, but maybe he'd also won a scholarship to, to go to university in Canada, which is a, a, a opportunity that many uh, sort of, or not many, but some of the lucky, most talented um, students in Dadaab get. I assumed that had been his story. And when I wrote to him, um, I expected him to be able to go back and use his contacts and find people who'd been affected. But instead he said, you know, this is my family's story. My family mm -hmm. has been waiting to be resettled since 2004. My parents were in the final stages of getting their visas. 
Uh, they had a, Marion had essentially abandoned the UN route and sponsored the Parents for Green Cards through a, a more traditional immigration avenue. But in any case, it applied to everyone equally. And so at the last minute, uh, you know, Assad was in the capital of Kenya, Nairobi, with his two parents waiting to get an interview at the, at the embassy. And the door was slammed shut one more time. So I invited him to write uh, about his family's experience. And he wrote this just beautiful, heart-wrenching, uh, devastating piece of writing for me um, at, at Foreign Policy. And we kept in touch afterwards and we, we met in person. Uh, we met in, in person to discuss the article because he happened to be in Nairobi. Um, and that's kind of when I first started to hear about his, his family's incredible story. And we met again because I had to pay him. And it's the only time I've ever paid a, 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 an author in, in cash because he didn't have a bank account. His, no one in his family had a bank account. And so I went to an ATM and and handed him a wad of cash. But um, after that, we started to meet pretty regularly in, in, in Nairobi. Um, and he decided to stay as sort of an, a, essentially as an undocumented person and live there and try to gain acceptance to a boarding school. Um, and so it happened that there was an opportunity for me and my wife to sponsor him um, and pay some of his tuition there and help him to make the transition to, to that boarding school, which was really an eye-opening experience for him you know he's suddenly he's gone from a from a refugee camp to a school that is kind of a to put it uncharitably uncharitably a playground for elite rich kenyans um and so this comes as quite of a shock to his system uh but that is that is the trajectory that lands him ultimately uh with this incredible opportunity and scholarship to study um at princeton and again, there are a thousand more rich details of the kind you're su suggesting in your book. Right at the beginning of your description, you mentioned offhandedly you had seen a piece in the New York Times magazine by a guy at a refugee camp. I've met hundreds of people in refugee camps, never one who's written in the New York Times magazine. What's the backstory of how, how he first got that kind of attention? It's, it's really an incredible story. Um, you know, as part of this, I think, experience of just devouring books in this little library that he was in, um, he, the first magazines I, I think he ever saw was there was this dusty pile of Reader's Digest magazines. And as he, you know, burned his way through everything that was available to him in the, in the camp, he started to look elsewhere. And there are no newspapers in the Dab. Uh, you can't go to the corner and, and, and put a quarter in the machine and get a newspaper. Uh, the only place that he could find newspapers was at the butcher shop. The meat would come wrapped in old newspapers and he would take these bloody old newspapers and he would read them. Um, and he would hope to find that there was a literary section in the Daily Nation, which is the local newspaper. And he would you know, look out for that every time. And it would be, you know, sort of a highlight of his week if he could find the literary section. And ultimately, um, he there was a little email address on there for submissions. And so he would start writing his own book reviews of whatever he could get his hands on in the library in Dadaab, and he would send them in. Uh, and of course, he never received a reply, but he would then go back to the butcher shop and hope maybe someday my review will appear. That never happened. Um, but he did eventually get published in the Daily Nation the first time he wrote, he wrote a letter to the editor uh, sort of criticizing the, the Kenyan curriculum. Uh, he felt that it was limiting in a lot of ways and causing unnecessary stress and blocking the sort of the creative juices of people like him. Uh, and it was really this kind of comical situation because here he is, you know, enrolled at that point, he's enrolled illegally in a school outside of Dadaab. But if the authorities were to catch him, they would send him back to the camp. Uh, but the Kenya's Ministry of Education responded to his his letter to the editor. They, you know, sent a rebuttal basically to, and he's thinking, here I am. I don't even merit a, an ID card. I'm essentially nobody in the eyes of the state, and yet, you know, the highest, most powerful bureaucrats in the country are responding to me in the pages of of, of the Daily Nation. So this kind of builds and snowballs, and he begins writing regular pieces for the Daily Nation, and then he goes through this really tough patch in his life where he doesn't win the scholarship that he hopes to win. Nothing seems to be going right. He keeps running up against all these barriers, most of which trace back to the fact that he doesn't have full citizenship in Kenya, and there are just no opportunities for people who are stateless like him. So he sets about giving himself like a writing schedule, and he writes one op-ed a week, and he sends them to the New York Times. 
And the one that ended up appearing came about, I think, sort of as the 40th or 50th one that he had sent. Somebody finally wrote back to him and said, you know, essentially, this isn't going to work, but I'm moving to a new role at the New York Times magazine um, and w we can find something to work on. And so th that's the origin of how this short piece came about uh, that then brought him onto my radar screen. And then in some ways, arguably, was the break that launched him uh, to Princeton, because at that point he was sort of on the map. He was this kind of famous young man who had written this story that, you know, I, there was a, another brief mention in the book. There was a, a president of an Oxford college who wrote to him uh, and said, I read your piece in the New York times, like you should consider applying to Oxford. And so he wrote back and he said, great, you know, sign me up, tell me where to send my application. Uh, but also said something about his status and said, you know, I'm a refugee and I don't have a passport. Like, is this going to be a problem? And sort of tragically, he never heard back from that university president, mm. um, just left him hanging there, which was, you know, I think the story of his life over and over and over again, where you have this glimmer of hope and then you have this disappointment. Um, so that's, that's, that is the story of, of the op-ed that, uh, that yeah. brought us together. And you also mentioned in setting up a sad story that, that you and your wife had played a role in sponsoring him and, and supporting him at a school. Um, I'll ask you the tedious journalistic question of whether you were, uh, whether you had to deal with your journalistic superiors about quote, being involved, uh, unquote, in that way. And what is your ongoing connection with Assad? Yeah, so luckily there was no uh, journalistic superiors because it's a book project that I was working on independently. At that point, I hadn't even sold the book, so I had no one to answer to but myself. But I did have the same um, question. Uh, and I had initially set out to do um, the, the project in a more traditional journalistic way. Mm -hmm. You know, I was conducting more or less formal interviews. Of course, we had become friends uh, and we had, a, a you know, a, our, our interviews often sort of drifted into bantering back and forth about the political situation in Kenya, about journalistic ethics. He's just this enormously fascinating guy to talk to and so very easy to talk to. Um, and so, you know, we, there was there was some degree of deviation from what I would say is like a formal interview. But the longer that we got to know each other and the more involved it seemed that our lives were, were becoming, it, to me, it became clear that it wasn't sustainable to keep that kind of distance um, and really to strive for that kind of objectivity. I think even in ordinary reporting, the standard that we hold ourselves to in some cases can be a little bit silly. Uh, you know, I think we all bring our biases to the story. We all, I, some might even call them values uh, that we bring to the story. And I, I, I question whether, um, you know, there's, there's much value in denying that sort of essential truth of we're all human beings, but certainly at, book length, uh, I found it impossible. And so what I, what I strove for instead of objectivity was honesty, honesty about the story and honesty about my role in it. And I really struggled with, you know, what do I do with the narrator? Uh, and I don't want the narrator to butt in where he's not wanted. I don't want him to overshadow the narrative. Uh, you, you know, the first rule probably anybody hears in journalism school is don't make yourself the story. Of course, I, I violated that to some degree, but I hope not so egregiously that people will uh, find my presence onerous uh, in, in the book. Um, but but yes, you know, we we he sort of became and for a time an extension of my wife and my family for reasons of enrolling him in this school. He needed yeah. a sponsor. And I believe we were even his legal guardian in according to the school for some brief period of time for the year that he was enrolled in Brookhouse. And we had to do things like call the boarding master and say, Assad would like to come home for the weekend. Uh, I went to father's breakfasts at Brook House, uh, which created some confusion. Um, but it was this really wonderful kind of, like such a privilege to get to have him as part of our lives. And he would post up and study for uh, the, you know, the SATs at our living room. And uh, there's a rather comical uh, little passage in the book about me trying to be of some use to him in his preparation for these college entry boards. And it had been about 15 years since I took the SAT at that point. And uh, let's just say it showed. I, I was <laughs> very little use to him. And, uh, you know, at the end of this sort of prolonged period of me trying to tell him how we'd gotten things wrong, he just kind of looked at me quietly and he said, you know, Ty, I'm pretty good at teaching myself at this point. <laughs> um, 
so that that's the story I think of how of how he became a part of our lives. And of course, when he came to the U.S., uh, we traveled with him on that. Yeah. You know, the the passage that I read for you at the beginning uh, of this hour. Um, I was on that flight. Uh, we, mm. my wife had lived in, in New York 15 years before we moved to Kenya. So it was very important to her to show Assad, the city that was so meaningful to her. And so we spent a while, uh, we, we went and saw the, the fireworks on the 4th of July, uh, you know, on the Williamsburg waterfront. We went to a Mexican restaurant at which point, um, Assad announced that his favorite American food so far was horchata. Uh, which I, I thought was pretty wonderful. Um, and then, yeah, we, we sort of kept in touch for the year, his first year that he was at Princeton. We tried to be you know there as much as we could. We tra I traveled to Princeton pretty frequently because I was still working on the book at that point. Uh, he would come and stay with us during, during the breaks. Um, and, and it was, you know, it's this really wonderful opportunity to get to sort of see him uh, embrace this new home. It was also very difficult for him, I think I should say, because he came to America at a time when we weren't showing our best face, I think, to the rest of the world, and certainly not to people uh, who came from backgrounds like him, his. Uh, I think he was really um, he was really destabilized by having the America that he had dreamed his whole life about mm. not be the one that he landed in. Uh, it was certainly not a place that people would speak about the way they speak about the hereafter. Uh, instead, it had turned sort of mean and inward and exclusionary. Um, and I think he felt that that weighed very heavily on him. Um, and I, I think he felt that his personhood was somehow up for debate all of the time about whether people like him should be are a part of the American experience. Um, and I think that he felt he felt that acutely uh, when when he came here. Mm -hmm. And it was embarrassing for me as a person who was, you know, had looked forward to sharing my country with him. I had hoped to have a better version of it be put forward. So I have one or two more questions I want to ask you myself. At this moment, I'm going to please invite members who are following along in this virtual meeting to start sending in questions um, too. And, and so, so here is a, a perhaps um, awkward question to ask. I'm going to use the, the premise of the very popular series of the last year, The Queen's Gambit about you know, this uh, a young woman who turns out to be a chess phenom, having been more or less self-taught in, in, in her rural background. One of the arcs in your story is sort of the conjunction of Assad being so gifted and autodidactic and broadly informed, et cetera, going through this sort of wave of disappointment of not doing well in a standardized test, being turned down from most places he applies to, except for Princeton, then getting into, into Princeton. The Queen's Gambit connection was the, the curiosity and doubt of this young woman in Kentucky of how would she fare on the national stage, on the world stage. You have somebody from a refugee camp who's taught himself a million things, was, um, didn't do well by a number of measures, but now is sort of, a, again, on the world stage in, the, in a world leading university. How has he fared in going to the world stage from the refugee camp? So the short answer is extremely well. He's thrived at, at Princeton and outdone many of his peers. Yeah. Um, I think the, the larger answer is that I actually see quite a lot of parallels between the way that the West keeps refugees out and the way that universities conduct their <laughs> admission processes. Yeah. Um, and I think Assad as a, as a refugee had to jump through both of those sets of hurdles, right. which took most of his adult life. Um, the, I think th there's an easy way to read this story that's almost like this sort of breezy narrative of triumph over adversity and over obstacles. And I guess what I hope that readers will take away from it instead is a better sense of those obstacles themselves. So many of the things that hold refugees uh, and really people from disadvantaged, all sorts of disadvantaged backgrounds back are invisible to people who don't face those yeah. uh, kinds of obstacles. And in some ways, I think the, the insidiousness really is in the imperceptibility of those obstacles. And so what I tried to do in the book was almost to map them, to put them out there and to create a record of all of the just, you know, mind numbing, you know, 
infuriating different obstacles that he had to go through, starting from the very basic fact that he did not have citizenship anywhere. When he filled out the uh, common application, which is a, it's a website that allows students to apply to more than one university at once, most of the big ones uh, are members of it. At the time, I've heard that this has since been rectified, but at the time that he applied, there was no option for a stateless applicant. You had to check one nationality or another. And so he you know, scrolls down the little menu and sees, okay, well, I've gotta be either Kenyan or I've gotta be Somali. And he says, well, which is the bigger lie? And so he decides that he's gonna check the Somali box because it's the only country that hasn't explicitly disowned him and said that you are not a, a, a citizen of this country. Um, and, and from there, the little obstacles just mount. And I think each one of them kind of can be imperceptible. It can be feel incremental. It can feel almost justifiable from the outside, but together they create this just insurmountable barrier to any kind of, uh, you know, to 99.9% .9 of people. Assad gets to where he does, um, certainly not taking anything away from his incredible abilities and his effort but largely because he has kindness of many, many, many people along the way. You read the, the story and from the very beginning, there's a man who donates books to the library, who uh, volunteers to send computers. There is, uh, you know, there's a character called Dr. Sue who takes Assad under, his, uh, under her wing, um, who convinces Brookhouse to admit him. The Brookhouse was, is the boarding school in Nairobi where he went. They had questions about having a refugee student there. They had faculty members who expressed concerns and had to be persuaded. That was Dr. Sue who did that. He won a scholarship uh, from a, a guy who's based in, in Britain who, who provided some of the, the funding. There's, of course, um, Mr. Melindy, who is his sort of the teacher and the headmaster of the school that goes out of the way to do uh, things for him. There's a Christmas Eve trip to fill out a, a recommendation for him uh, where he leaves the family and said, you know, he, I wouldn't have done this for any other student except for Assad. Um, so over and over and over again, there are people who uh, helped Assad around these barriers. And to me, the story is the barriers were, they're impossible for, for almost everyone to, to, to get over. And that's kind of the point. That's why they're there. And I think the college admission piece of it we sort of imagine it to be at least a somewhat fair process, that it's designed, that these hurdles are almost designed to make it fairer for everyone going through them. But the reality is, is that for, I don't think this is an exaggeration to say, the vast majority of people on this planet, they are impossible to get around because they require so many resources to get through them. Even, and I'll just say this in, in passing, that to apply for financial aid at Princeton, you have to have a credit card and pay a fee. So here you are literally begging for money and you're expected to already have some to begin with. So um, my view of these arbitrary uh, barriers is very, very much in sync with yours. Just one specific question. Why would it be that Princeton of all institutions would be the place that gave him a chance? I say of all institutions because a number of other places that are nowhere near as exclusive or selective um, turned him down. Why did it work out at Princeton? I think it's a couple of things. One is the simple fact that the top universities have the most money. Um, so he wasn't, he didn't even apply to a lot of state universities and places that would have been a great home for him. And he would have been very happy to, to, to study at. But, uh, you know, we were advised by other people I know who are in the education world that don't even try because they don't have scholarship money for, for foreign students within the 10 schools that he applied to, I think it was either eight or 10 and, he was rejected from nine of 10 or seven of eight. I, I can't remember. And it was sort of this dramatic, you know, end to it because it was the very last school that he, that informed him uh, that, that he had gotten in. Um, I don't think it's an accident that it was Princeton. I think Princeton has actually been on the forefront of uh, trying to support refugees. And they've, they've hmm. co-signed a lot of letters protesting some of Trump's policies. They uh, have been very proactive about trying to be, uh, I think on the, on the front end leading on this issue, they, I will also say they, they hired a law firm to essentially get Assad here after they had accepted him. Uh, they, they hired a firm that then wrote a 15 or 20 page memo of outlining all the ways in which the Trump travel ban should not apply to 
mm-hmm. Assad because he had been granted a student visa because he hadn't actually been born in Somalia because he was coming on a, a UN conventional travel document. But that's an extraordinarily extraordinary level of commitment to a student who has yet to set foot on your campus uh, and that they took that upon themselves to do that. You know, there are other ways in which these universities, I think, are in some ways clueless about people in Assad's position. They don't realize that their students have nowhere else to live, uh, you know, d- during a break or, for instance, during a pandemic. They don't realize that they're dependent on uh, a, a student dining facility that is somebody who doesn't have resources to fall back on really needs to have a dining facility open during the break. Some of these things get totally missed at places like Princeton because I think nine out of 10 people who go there are extraordinarily privileged by world standards and even by American standards. Um, but in other ways, they really are, I think, pushing uh, the boundaries of what is done uh, to support refugees. And there's actually an initiative now um, that I, I believe people at Princeton are, are involved in. And there's a lawyer who's been uh, working with uh, a, a group of university presidents to try to create a, a visa that universities can sponsor mm-hmm. refugees directly. Um, this is a long way from becoming law, but it would mirror the Canadian system in a lot of ways. The Canadian um, universities can sponsor uh, people in Canada. Can s- groups of people can get together and raise their hand and say, we'll sponsor hmm. a refugee. And they're responsible for them and they help them transition to, to their new homes. Um, and I think this, this bill that's being, um, being proposed and, and worked up by uh, a group of, of people um, would, would start to put the United States in that direction. And I, and I don't think it's an accident that Princeton is involved in that as well. Uh, that, that is very interesting. I hadn't known that. And so that uh, congrats to to Princeton for and its allies for those initiatives. One of the things that's impressive and valuable about your book is that it's not a policy book. And although it's about the effects of policy and politics, it's a narrative book. It's a family book. It's a suspense book in, in various ways. But I'm going to put you in a policy position um, if you were in charge of the U.S. refugee policy right now or of international refugee policy now, what are the most important things the U.S. should be doing to have a sustainable and a morally defensible um, pol- uh, outlook towards refugees around the world? I think number one action item is restoring the refugee resettlement program to something around where it was, and I would say grow it. Um, but the reality is, is that over the last, you know, the United States has a, a checkered history when it comes to living up to our, uh, you know, the values that are written in the famous Emma Lazarus poem at the base of the, the, the Statue of Liberty. We have not always been a country that, uh, that does that. Mm-hmm. Since 1980, we've been actually pretty good on the refugee front. Um, and three out of four refugees that have been resettled anywhere in the world have been resettled in the United States during that time. It's three million out of four million people. On any given year prior to the Trump presidency, the U.S. was resettling more people than the rest of the world combined, than the rest of the 36 or 37 other designated resettlement countries. These are countries like the U.K., like Canada. Um, Can I interrupt you there? I I mean, that very sentence you just said, you could hear that in a speech by... um, Steve Bannon or Stephen Miller or Trump himself, that the U.S. is being um, abused. You know, the rest of the world is not doing its part. The U.S. is doing more than its part. What would be your response to that kind of um, Bannon-esque um, use of the same data? Well, that is certainly not the way that I intended uh, that data to be used. I would say that the U.S. is leading. That's what leadership looks like. Um, and I think that it's a, a hugely underappreciated fact just how powerful of a soft power tool refugee resettlement is. You go to places in the world where large numbers of refugees are resettled and people have an extraordinarily high opinion of the U.S., in my opinion, at a very low cost to the United States. Um, What what the United States needs to do now, I think, and what it should do is to work to restore what it had built, what, what, what had resulted in such, I think, a positive... Um, you know, image for itself and for the people that that were being resettled and then rally, you know, the 30 or so richest countries in the world to do more. I agree with you that all of these countries should be doing more, but it should be also about expanding the number of countries that are involved in refugee resettlement. Right now, the refugee resettlement system is woefully out of date. It resettles 
maybe about 1%, less than 1% of people who are displaced and wanting to be resettled each year. It's going to be, you know, decades, if not a hundred years before people are given homes at the rate that we're doing it. But it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me that China, for instance, is nowhere in this conversation. We talk about China ad nauseum, about every other policy area, but not about refugee resettlement. And Part of it is that I think people, for well-meaning reasons, say, well, China is abusing the rights of its citizens. It's treating its Uyghur minority terribly. Like, how could we think about sending uh, particularly Muslim refugees there? Uh, to which I say, well, that's a terrible incentive structure. We're saying, because you're badly behaved, we're not going to ask you to pull your weight. And China's being asked to uh, be seen as a leader on the world stage in lots of different ways. Um, I, to me, if I was in the Biden administration, that would be one way in which I would expect China to step up to the plate and to actually play the role of a, of a leading power. Right now, China doesn't even have a, a, a legal definition for asylum in its legal code. Uh, it does, it does not participate in the refugee resettlement uh, process. It says, you know, we're still a developing country. Yeah. We have problems of our own. It's, you know, we, the stability of the country would be put at risk if we did this. I say that's got to change, you know, countries that are, emerging and becoming leading powers need to be part of the solution. And we're really only talking about half a percentage of the world's population. So it is a solvable problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that problem, I think, involves middle income, emerging countries, and then quite a lot of more resettlement on, on the part of the West. These are countries that have aging populations, that the, yeah. the, the math for the welfare state doesn't add up after a while. Um, and refugees tend to be younger. They tend to be working age. Yeah. Uh, and certainly from the Kenyan camps, they are pretty well educated. That's not the case, uh, I think, by and large, in, in some refugee uh, settings. But certainly in Kenya, um, having been to all of these camps, uh, I can say that it's not a coincidence that Assad was educated there and then was able to make the transition. The top you know, students in these schools year after year after year become, uh, you know, functional members of so society in places like Canada and the U.S. They become doctors, they become nurses, they become engineers. Um, and, you know, if we expanded resettlement opportunities, I think we could do so with an eye for, for filling gaps that we have uh, in our labor force here. Yes. And, and for the record, I also my my life experience within the U.S. and outside the U.S. also convinces me of both the practical, the cultural, the um, idealistic value to the recipient country of having ref of being a home for refugees has been made a huge difference in the United States. Can you help people watching uh, for just some numbers for scale? Roughly how many refugees per year was the U.S. resettling during the, the, the pre Trump era? How much under Trump? What would be a reasonable target to build back up towards? Yeah, so in Obama's last year, it was 85,000-ish mm -hmm. that were resettled. Uh, and by the end of Trump's pre uh, presidency, his last full year was about 12,000 refugees that came. Um, so it's not just that he cut it, you know, slashed it to a quarter of the rate or less than a quarter of the rate that it was. But also that he changed the, the regional breakdown of it and uh, largely skewed it toward uh, white and European um, yeah. countries and certainly less Muslim countries. That was a factor of both an intentional policy decision by the White House and also of the, the Muslim country ban. If you're not resettling people from Muslim countries, you're going to have fewer uh, Muslim um, refugees who are resettled. Um, Biden on the campaign trail promised to raise it to 125,000, which would be greater than it ever was under Obama. I'm not sure historically. Mm -hmm. I think it's on the higher end, if not the highest. Uh, since 1980, um, he has so far done almost nothing uh, on this mm -hmm. uh, count. He he. The paperwork was drawn up for um, an emergency uh, lifting of the cap, of this year's cap. Usually, the cap is set in a presidential uh, determination as part of the fiscal year. So Biden will do that in the fall sometime, and he will say what the cap is for next year. But he's also legally allowed to raise the cap that was already set by Trump and. He set out to do that. The State Department was prepared, so prepared, in fact, that they booked flights for 700 refugees around the world, expecting them to be admitted, and then rather embarrassingly had to cancel those flights uh, with devastating effect for some refugees. I was reading an account of a woman who was uh, pregnant at the time that she was expecting to come uh, and has since had the child. And so that means that she now has to sit through a whole another bureaucratic process 
of adding a person to your settlement case. So far, instead of coming, rejoining with her family, beginning a new life in the United States, she's stuck in Congo, still now trying to deal with more bureaucracy. So, you know, I think that's another piece of this. I think people think, well, okay, it's a delay. People will just come later. But these are life altering, sometimes life ending decisions in Dadaab. When, when the Trump travel ban came down, people with life alt- you know, with, with life threatening diseases were, uh, and health conditions were denied travel restriction for things like cancer treatment, um, and, and some of them died as a result of, of this process. Um, so I think, you know, this is a, a question that we'll have to see what the Biden administration does, whether it eventually uh, lifts that, that ban. I think right now it's gotten kind of confused with the situation on on the southern border and i think there's a sense that maybe i don't have any special insight into what the white house is thinking but perhaps there's a feeling that uh these two issues will be conflated in the minds of voters and that if uh biden lifts the refugee cap while he's facing what is seen as a crisis on the southern border then he will be soft on immigration he will be soft on all of these things that he gets beat up for uh by the republicans as somebody you know i think who is also a voter, um, I find that to be a little bit condescending. Like, I think that you can expect Americans to, uh, to, to be able to parse these two things and to see that they're different issues. Um, and certainly the voters do. Like, the polling suggests that Americans, by and large, support refugee resettlement. Um, there was a, a provision that Trump put in place um, where he essentially gave communities veto power over resettlement mm-hmm. in their communities. And I think I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the Trump administration expected more communities to use that veto power than actually did. Certainly in red states, they thought that people were going to say, you know, send the refugees someplace else. Uh, that didn't happen by and large. And the, the you know, places, Fort Worth, uh, Houston, um, you know, it's uh, Atlanta there. They tend to be, I guess, blue cities within red states. But um, there are certainly red states and red cities that are saying we would like to have refugees resettled here uh, because people recognize the value to their communities. They recognize that they help revitalize economies that have uh, declined over the last you know, decades. Um, so I think if you, if, if you look at that polling and you look at what policymakers are telling you, uh, it, it leads you down the direction of, of restoring those numbers to, to somewhere around where they were before. Yes, repertorially, my experience is the same. I'm thinking of, of cities in Kansas and South Dakota, which are politically very conservative, but recognize that refugees are just an essential part of their of their future and have gone to great lengths to try to incorporate them. Um, stipulating that your book is not about uh, the southern border of the United States and you're not a policy expert on that. Um, as you mentioned earlier, when when American journalists are talking about movements of people right now, 80% of their attention is towards the southern border. How does your your knowledge of refu- the refugee situation in general inform what how you think this issue should be discussed? You know, if you were in charge of news desks covering the U.S. southern border, how would you talk about the refugee components of it and the other components? I think that the key thing that is often missed here is that Asylum is a legal obligation that the the United States has an obligation to offer that right to people. And I think it gets conflated with economic migration and with questions of how many people the United States should bring in every year. And the reality is, is a lot of the policies that are, quote unquote, immigration policies of the last, you know, particularly over the last presidency, but are still in place uh, right now, are effectively policies that prevent people from exercising a legal right that the United States is obligated to recognize under international law, under the conven- the UN Refugee Convention and other conventions as well, uh, that have now just been um, disregarded. And this is kind of across the board that this is happening. Uh, you know, I think uh, one way to think about it is sort of as the slow death of asylum as a, a right and as a pillar of, of the liberal order. Uh, you know, as I said, China doesn't recognize it. Russia doesn't have the same way of thinking about it. Increasingly, European countries don't have the same way of thinking about it. Um, and so I think one part of the coverage uh, needs to be looking at those legal questions and saying, like, this this isn't a, a policy question to be debated necessarily. This is a question of whether the United States is living up to its legal obligations under the law. And then you can talk about things like how many you know visas to grant for 
uh, you know, different categories of workers and how many people should come across the border and what you should do with families that come uh, and don't meet the definition of asylum. But you need to offer people an opportunity to claim asylum and then you need to adjudicate those claims. Right now, those claims are not being adjudicated. They're backlogged in, you know, endless court delays here or people are being told to, to claim it in Mexico or in, in Central American countries. Um, that I think a lot of lawyers would tell you is, is, is not how that is supposed to work. We're coming to the final few minutes here. And so I have one more sort of big picture question to, 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 to ask you. And I'll set it up with my own personal theory of immigration and refugee absorption in the United States, which is the U.S., through most of its history has been in a pendulum type uh, movement of, of going from one extreme of policy and cultural approach to another. There was, of course, tremendous uh, Chinese presence in the Western uh, United States in the, the mid 1800s. Then there were the Chinese Exclusion Acts. There was the huge um, surge of immigration around the time just before World War I. And then, of course, the restrictionist laws, which um, uh, came in effect in the 1920s. There was the sea change in immigration policy with the 1960s acts, which which broadened America's openness to the world, et cetera, et cetera. And there were after the the um, wave of refugees from Cuba and from Haiti and from Southeast Asia in the early 1980s, there was both absorption and then there was some some contraction. Um, where do you think we are? Uh, I'm going to ask you to accept my hypothesis that there are waves of openness and close close downness in America's openness to the world. And it would be better, in my view, if it were sort of a steady state openness, but just observing history, there are these waves. Um, we've just been through an extreme wave of contraction, certainly re refugees and in the sense of America being e pluribus unum you know, more generally. Do you think that wave will continue or give me how, how you think, if you accept this waves theory, uh, what wave is in store for us? I think the pandemic is really the question mark that that will answer that question. I agree with you that the United States, perhaps because we are a nation that is uh, organized around a set of ideas and ideals rather than an ethnocentric definition of, of nationality, we're always caught between our better and our worst angels. And I think when we when we live up to our ideals, we can be a beacon of hope. Uh, and when we when we don't, we often live to regret it. You know, I think the the stains on our national uh, history in the 1930s, turning away Jews from Europe in the 1970s, turning away our South Vietnamese allies, uh, and then now, I mean, uh, uh, turning away many of the the um, local partners in Iraq and Afghanistan that made those war efforts possible, and now are waiting endlessly for visas while they're being hunted down by the Taliban or, or, or Al Qaeda, which uh, views them as, as traitors. So I agree that it's this, it's this pendulum of, 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 of living up to our ideals and not. I would have had a more optimistic answer to where we were headed had we not just gone through an incredible experience that brought a lot of our globalized system unglued. I think there's incredible pressure to make trade ties, um, less vulnerable, all sorts of movement uh, that, that was sort of taken for granted between and among countries is now thrown into question. And I think borders are getting harder and harder. Just to travel somewhere today, you know, you would probably have to take a COVID test. You may soon have to, to show a vaccine passport. Um, there's no plan to vaccinate most refugees right now. There are no plans to vaccinate most people in the developing world, realistically. Countries like Kenya, the government will tell you otherwise, but realistically, there is almost no chance that most Kenyans will be vaccinated by 2023 or 2024. So we're talking about a long you know, period of time here where travel and migration flows will be interrupted. So I think that we are kind of, we're caught at a crossroads uh, and we're likely to be stuck here for some time before we see a resolution. And unfortunately, I think, uh, there's a chance that we may slide back in a, in a direction that looks more like the Trump years uh, before we have a chance to come unstuck from our pandemic years. You know, that we're not done with this debate as a country. I think we haven't decided which direction we're going. We are, we're, we are a country that's very, very divided on these issues. Um, and I don't think that we've heard the last word from, from uh, you know, Donald Trump's 
supporters. So I wish I had a more optimistic uh, you know, message to leave you with, but I think that the pandemic has really thrown a wrench uh, in, in efforts to uh, restore human mobility to, to, to the levels that we had before. Well, that is an honest and a useful answer. And there are many more things I'd like to ask you, but we've we've hit the, the end of our, our time here. I just wanted to thank you very much, Ty, for joining us and encourage all of the anybody who sees this broadcast to buy and read read your book. I'm going to give the official I'm going to read in just a second the official close to the session, but just wanted to thank you for the the labors of love and intellectual effort that went into producing this this book. And I hope I think it will have a long life and it is a very important document of of these times of what uh, the, the kind of personal vivid details of, of one of the, the great issues of America's future and the world's future. So congratulations and thanks for joining us. So just to all members of the Commonwealth Club here, I'd like to extend our thanks to Ty McCormick, author of the new book, Beyond the Sand and Sea, One Family's Quest for a Country to Call Home. I'd like to thank uh, Ty for joining us and, and would like to thank our audience for watching and participating, participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's effort to make virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org online. I'm James Fallows. Thank you and stay safe and healthy.